I'm looking at the game between Fabiano Caruana and Anish Giri from round 12 of the Candidates Tournament. And this was a tremendous game. This is classical chess at its best. Fine strategy, sharp tactics, and both players having to use their judgment very well. Um, yeah, you're gonna, I think you're going to enjoy this one. I certainly did. It was a great round. All decisive games in this round. So don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. Let's try and hit that 100k and do consider supporting us via PayPal or Patreon.com. So here we go. Caruana with the white pieces. So at the start of this round, Nepo in the lead, Giri a half point behind him and Caruana a full point behind Nepo. So basically with three rounds to go, Caruana realised that he had to play for a win in this game. A draw wouldn't really upset things and he could find himself just further behind and out of it. So I think certainly Caruana in, in a, an almost must-win situation. Um, and that's a nice situation for Giri to be in because, of course, you know he wanted to play for a win as well. But a draw would be okay for him basically. So we have a Sicilian, open Sicilian, that suits Caruana, he wants a good fight. And it's not a Sveshnikov, so we can see how hard Giri has been working. However, I mean, this is a, a four-night Sicilian. However, it could transpose into a Sveshnikov. So bear with me while I, while I discuss move order here for a little bit. If Caruana wants to go into a Sveshnikov from this position, he can by playing knight b5, d6, bishop f4, and then bishop g5, main line Sveshnikov. But notice that Caruana, via this move order, hasn't been able to get in his favourite knight d5 move early on, which he used against Carlsen in the World Championship match. So a clever bit of thinking from Giri, trying to outfox Caruana here. Um, I mean, there are, of course, there are other ways for white to play. This is one of the main lines. Incredibly sharp, and no doubt uh, Giri was ready for that as well. So he's obviously done an incredible amount of opening preparation in, uh, in his lockdown year. Um, Caruana thought for almost five minutes here. I mean, you know, perhaps he was a little bit wrong-footed by this opening. So clever from Giri already. But Caruana played a3. Okay, interesting. Well, prevents bishop b4. I should say another move uh, that's possible here is bishop b2 and then bishop b4, for example. That's an interesting continuation. But a3, bishop b7. And now we transpose into a kind of Scheveningen, where white has this move a3 at a very early stage. Now, that move can be useful later on, can transpose into normal lines when black advances with a6 and b5. But it is still very early, and instead of the, the normal castles, and I think black could equalize because of that poor move a3. Caruana's played queen d3. Very interesting move. And this really is unusual. Um, and he's looking perhaps to castle queenside. So this was the first time that... Uh, well, Giri had, a, of course, a serious think here. He thought for... Almost eight minutes over bishop d7. f4. And here, for example, if black plays in a fairly standard way by exchanging and bishop c6, that's very normal for this kind of setup, putting the bishop on this nice diagonal, looking at this pawn. Then white could go queenside, and we've got a, a really sharp position in our hands. And, and you know, that's, that's interesting from Caruana's perspective. But Giri decided to break 
in the center straight away. This is the great advantage of the Skaveningen setup. You have these two pawns on the sixth rank and it gives you great flexibility. You can decide when to push one of them to d6 or e5, depending on how white sets up. And considering that Caruana has played, well, relatively slowly, then to my eyes it's very logical to push forward in the center immediately. You know, white hasn't castled yet. So Caruana thought for six minutes or so, exchanged on c6. And, and once again, if bishop takes, then I think castles is quite interesting for white. But Geary played pawn takes, very logical. That pawn now covers the crucial d5 square and the b-file is opened. Castle's kingside. And already I would say Geary would have been fairly happy with his position. These pawns cover these crucial squares. Um, he's, you know, there's no attack on black's king here. Then again, Caruana could be reasonably happy as well. He's got his queen to a nice active square. Very often this comes to g3 via e1, but it's not unknown that it comes into the game via d3 to g3. There's a bit of pressure here. Um, but all in all, I would have thought Geary would be somehow happier with this position. But anyway, we've got an interesting position on the board. Now, this is a very funny moment. Geary thought for about seven minutes and played the knight back to d7, a very standard idea, looking to perhaps play the knight into e5, but also freeing this bishop for action somewhere on this diagonal. Funny thing is, there were lots of people screaming online during the game saying, oh my word, the computer recommends h5, and indeed this is the favourite move of most computers. Incredible. Um, I mean, one sees this move in Sicilians, and black can get away with this because black has three pawns in front of the king. And if you advance the h-pawn, it doesn't actually damage your king that much. Um, I quite like h5. Um, and basically, you know, you want to advance and push the queen and cramp black's king position. Uh, so, for example, here, king h1, for example, h4. Now, if that's taken, you can take here, hitting the queen. Um, or you can play knight d5 and take the bishop. So, after this, queen e1, knight d7. You can see that pawn is not vulnerable. It's well protected. You've pushed the queen back. You're cramping white's king. And, you know, the knight can come into e5. It's actually pretty solid for black. But, it, you know, it's also playable for white, and you never know, later on, that might be vulnerable. But I just think it's fascinating that this is the computer's first choice. Now, if Geary had played that in the game, well, <laughs> it would have been uh, surprising, and I think we might have had to... Uh, have, had, have another electronics test after the game. But anyway, he played the human move, knight d7, a very s standard move in these kind of positions. Now, what about bishop takes pawn? This didn't happen. That would be a mistake. Because then black's queen would come out to check the king and then take on b2. And you can see that white's pawns are a bit of a mess here. You can see that bishop, in these kind of variations, that bishop just is a rock in black's position. It's, um, I mean, you know, I've, I've played the Nidorf and the, and, and the Chevy, all these Sicilian variations, um, and I love it when I get a bishop here. It is so chunky. Protects f7, it's a solid square, and here, basically, the queen can run riot uh, completely safe. But that didn't happen. Rook d1 played a much better move with some pressure here. So I'd say um, Fabio was probably reasonably happy with this position. 
and rook e8 play. Incidentally, queen b6 check and taking um, on b2 would not be advisable. This is a very poisoned pawn. This is a pawn that is laced with arsenic. Uh, just watch what happens. Mate threatened. Knight e5. Rook b1. And the queen is trapped here. Or if uh, queen takes, then this typical trick. Knight d5 exposing the queen here. And if queen takes queen, knight takes bishop. Check. That's the crucial thing. And white is a piece up. So no, that one, not a good move in this case. Rookie, very sensible. Common move in these kind of positions. Uh, potentially makes room for the bishop. Um, and also looks at the e-pawn. Very good move. King h1, yep. About time the king just got out of the way. Queen b8. Good move. So again, looking at the pawn on b2. And I think this is a very important position in the game. And here is where I think Fabi just misjudges the situation. So what would you play here if you had the white pieces? What would you do? Have a little thing. I'll have a little slurp of my Queen in Siberia mug. Is Black's Queen in Siberia? Hmm, we're going to find out soon. Here, um, well, I think taking is nothing special again. Um, I think black is fine in this kind of position. But the move that I think is, is fine for white is b3. Just keeping these pawns nice and solid. And if knight e5, yep, that's fine. Um, I mean, this is one of the ideas of queen b8. Support that knight. But I think white has a little initiative here. And now this knight is going nowhere from here. But if we play knight e2 instead and bounce it around to d4, looking at the bishop, looking at these squares, that's a pretty nice square. White has a little initiative there. Um, I don't think black is in a huge amount of danger. Black is solid enough. But, you know, white has something to play for there. But Fab Fabi lashed out with b4. Um, you know, and that is incredibly ambitious. But let's see if it's any good. Knight e5. Well, you only play a move like that, which really doesn't leave... What, <laughs> White's queenside pawns in a very attractive manner. Um, I mean, there are sort of holes all over the place that, you know, that pawn can be hit later on. C4 is a, is a weak square. Basically, Fabi, this was Fabi's idea. He was pushing on. So he's trying to sort of conquer the d5 square to get a, a better square for that knight. But it rebounds really badly because it means that those squares are now very weak on the c-file. Of course, Fabi realised that, but he thought that he was getting somewhere with this move knight d5. And I suspect that he'd calculated some variations and here and thought, yeah, they're looking good. So, for example, if bishop takes knight... Well, uh, these, these are definitely not black's best moves, but let me just show you what uh, Fabi might have been thinking. This is just too risky. And now the queen really is in Siberia once white starts attacking. Uh, this is really dangerous. Uh, if h6, then queen f5 is a disaster for black. That reminds me of uh, Nepo's game from the other day. And now rook takes pawn. And queen takes, and this is a winning attack. So was that the kind of thing that was running through Fabi's mind and thinking, yeah, I've got some attacking chances here with that knight on d5. But Geary's next move, I suspect, was a bit of a cold shower. Queen f8, excellent move. I mean, this queen has been doing some great duty, actually, on the back rank. 
first to b8, and now it comes back to f8. And that simply makes room for black's rook to enter the game. Um, as of course, as well as protecting this bishop. Um, and and just holding the king side. It's a little bit passive just for a moment, but actually it holds the fort and allows rook number two to enter the game. And this changes the complexion of the position. And Fabi thought for um, 20 minutes here, and I'm not surprised, um, because he has to adjust now. You know, he could exchange pieces like this, but because his pawns are very weak, he has to be careful. And I think this is roughly level. Um, but he could have, um, yeah, well, a bit of a defensive task ahead of him once those bishops are exchanged. Um, another way to do it. Bishop d3, I think this is about even. Um, so, for example, after these exchanges. But it, it's very hard for white to get any kind of advantage in this in this position. You know, maybe maybe d5. Or maybe just, you know, bring, bring the rook into play. But I suspect Fabi was trying to keep some winning chances in this position. He didn't want to exchange pieces. But suddenly, things are swinging around. Now, instead of exchanging, he defends that pawn, but this is a bit passive. Knight hits the bishop, which uh, retreats. Bishop h4, excellent move. So that saves that bishop hits the queen, which moves over to, to a poor square. Rook c5, yep, yeah, bit of pressure here, nice. c4, and now an excellent move from Geary. h6. I mean, it's not not so unusual in these positions, but it, that it really emphasizes that things are going black's way. So that bishop wants to come back and exchange off this dark squared bishop and then you can see that black has very good control over these central dots, dots was. Um, that bishop is now a poor piece, blocked in by its own pawns. And that, well, that's bishop takes knight is on the cards, uh, reaching a, a good knight against bad bishop position, as we're going to see very soon. So really no alternative but to exchange. And here... Well, I was amazed at the way uh, Fabiano played here. I thought he should just preserve that knight. That keeps the position a little bit complex. Now, there's no doubt uh, black is better here. Position, you can see that. These minor pieces are, are really superb. There's pressure here. Um, and I think, you know, moves like g6, king g7, maybe an attack on the h-file. It's a nice position for black, but white is still in the game. But queen g3, I think Fabi uh, was still dreaming of a, a kingside attack. Um, again, I think that knight should drop. But rook d1, bishop takes, pawn takes. So now we've got this classic good knight against bad bishop position. And maybe Fabi was thinking knight e5. That's you know, typical move for this, this kind of position. That knight it really dominates the bishop here. Um, and I suspect this is what Fabi was banking on. Rook f5 and then h4. And actually, this is quite dangerous that that rook hits the h-file. But instead of the, the, the kind of routine knight e5, Giri very quickly played a knight f4, and it's an excellent move. His judgment was spot on here. Hits the bishop. So queen f2. Now, obviously, we, we don't take the bishop. There's 
um, a problem with f7. But rook c7, simple move, protecting the pawn. Rook d4, queen e8, so that threatens the bishop. Bishop f3, and now, yeah, there's, there's a huge problem here, basically. So the bishop moved, and Giri took the pawn on c4. Caruana took on a7, but rook a4 wins a pawn. And here's why. If Caruana goes for that d-pawn, here's a really nice tactic. Queen takes pawn, rook takes bishop. Now, rook takes rook, queen e1 is mate. And if pawn takes rook, queen e2 is a killer, threatening two mates in one. Uh, and if check, well, the checks make no difference, actually. Still problem with rook here. And queen check, mate, mate next move, basically. So uh, white drops a pawn, rook takes a3. Black is a pawn up, but not only that, this bishop is a rotten piece. You see this so often in, in the Sicilian. Uh, that knight is a great piece. I mean, normally it just kind of anchors itself on the e5 square. Um, well, uh, it, it's, it's on a great square on f4 as well. And, and White's problem here is that the king only has two pawns in front of it, uh, whereas black has three pawns. So black's king is basically just more secure than white's. So black has this long-term initiative uh, against the king, basically. Even if you exchange queens here, there would still be a huge problem with the advance of this pawn majority, cramping white's king. Fabi lashes out with h4. Um, trying to undermine that knight, but, well, it makes no difference. Just brings the queen into the game. Um, but I have to say, you know, by this point, I think but white is basically just lost in, in the long term. So the rook comes back to a8 to guard the back rank. Bishop e4, and now, funny moment, this was move 40. Giri played rook a2. If queen takes rook, then queen h4, check, picks up the rook, and then the bishop. Um, but after rook b1, be careful, rook takes queen, rook there is mate. The rook had to come back again. But it doesn't matter. Basically, there's nothing that white can do in this position. Time is not the issue here. Um, white's chronic weaknesses, the poor bishop the insecure king, these are the problems. Um, so they repeated the position once and now they've reached the time control and Giri could reset and just calm down a bit. And now he went for the kill. F5. So if bishop f3, then knight d3 picks up the exchange. So the bishop came back here. And this is the point of f5, king f7 making room for the rook. The king is totally secure on f7. Has enough cover. Rook e3. Rook h8. Check. King comes over and a final destructive move. The knight destroys the last pawn in front of white's king. And here Caruana resigned. Um, let's just go through exactly why. If queen takes knight, queen takes rook check, exchange up, uh, well, mating attack, and a, a discovered check threatened, the rook is threatened. If rook g3, check, king takes knight, and queen h1 mate. A lovely bit of geometry there. And that final position illustrates White's problem so often in the Sicilian. Basically, White's king comes under fire because there are only a couple of pawns in front of the king. Once, I'm going to go right back, once that f-pawn advances, 
and white castles on this side of the board, basically you only have two pawns in front of your king. That's why I love playing the Sicilian with black. You have three pawns. Your king is more secure. Now, you know, white plays with pieces on the king side and sometimes breaks through. But if it goes wrong, then that's what you end up with. And so often that happens. But keep that quiet. That's a little Sicilian secret. Wow. So what's happening with the standings? Well, at this moment, after uh, Giri won that game, well, Nepo was still playing against Wang Hao, grinding away. And in the end, he managed to win against uh, Wang. So, well, I mean, Anish had done brilliantly there. He's basically knocked out Caruana from the competition. And now really only two players can win the tournament. We have Nepo, Yanyipom Nishi on eight out of 12. We have Giri on seven and a half out of 12. Vashilikov on six and a half, but he's basically out of it. He won today, by the way. Um, very nice for Maxime. So Nepo on eight, Giri on seven and a half. Tomorrow, crucial games. Giri has black against Grishuk. Well, anything can happen there. You know, what day of the week is it? Um, I, should, I should say there's a rest day tomorrow. They're playing on Monday, of course. I have to remember that. So anyway, Giri plays Grishuk. We don't know which Grishuk is going to turn up. The genius that defeated uh, Maxime or the player that just dissolves in time pressure, we don't know. And Nepo has white against Maxime Vashilokov. Remember, the first if if the players are tied after 14 rounds, the first tie break is individual results. And of course, Nepo has one and a half half against Giri. So Nepo will win uh, if they're tied. So that is a big advantage. So Nepo still looking good, but this next round is going to be absolutely crucial. Anything can still happen in this tournament. Um, and well, we've had some crazy candidates tournaments in the past, so nothing is decided yet. Okay, there we go. Well, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Um, thanks for watching. More videos coming your way soon.